If I told you that you were being watched, that right behind you there was someone or something watching your every move, you might feel a little uneasy. You might call my bluff and just ignore the thought. I couldn't possibly know if you were being watched or not. Right? By now, you might have turned around to check, or at least are resisting the urge to. That uncertainty as to whether or not you are being observed is unsettling, but not scary per se. You haven't confirmed or denied the presence of anyone watching you, but the possibility that there could be is not something our minds like to deal with. And it's that ambiguity that video games can employ to make a level, a moment, or an enemy deeply troubling. I am Daryl, and this is Psych of Play. Some of the weirdest and most interesting enemies in video games have one or more big, abnormal eyeballs. Goma in Zelda, Andros in Star Fox, Necromorphs, Fatal Frame Ghosts, the list goes on. Disembodied, disproportionate, and discolored eyes are a staple for any level or enemy that is designed to be freaky. Giant flashy eyes in video games are weird, and they make for good targets when you need an obvious weak spot. But what exactly makes an eye creepy? Earlier I mentioned that the uncertainty of whether or not something is watching you makes you feel uneasy, but in video games when you see an eyeball, typically it's looking right at you. So there's no question of if you're being watched, but rather what exactly is watching you, and why. These questions tap into a deep-rooted survival instinct. Eyes are used for vision, of course, but they are also used as a form of communication. If the intention of a gaze is not clear, it can be mistaken as a threat. If you and I are friends, and we are at lunch with a group of co-workers, and I make a casual joke about your favorite movie whilst smiling at you, you know that I'm simply poking fun at you. But if I sat in silence, with no smile, no speech, and we were not friends or even acquaintances, me staring at you might make you feel a little anxious. So I think what makes eyes so creepy in games is that they are presented without any additional social context. When an eye is disembodied, the only information you can get from it is where it's looking. Often you don't know whose eye it is or why it's looking at you. Is it staring at me because I look tasty? Is it judging me? Is it scared of me? Is it laughing at me? That uncertainty or vagueness is what makes it so skin crawling. The gaze doesn't even need to be on the player to trigger this ambiguity. Picture this. You are sitting in the back of a large theater waiting for a play to start. 300 people around you are all talking amongst themselves while you play on your phone. You begin to realize that it's growing oddly quiet. You look up to the stage to see what's going on, only to realize that the entire audience is turned around looking directly behind you. What do you do? Well, other than shit your pants, you'd probably turn around as fast as you could to see what you were missing. This is a phenomena observed a lot in social psychology called informational influence. The group we are in has given us reason to believe that there is vital information that we are out of the loop on, in this case that something is behind us, and until we see what that is, this makes us very nervous. One of the best in-game examples of this is in Celeste's Mirror Temple. Eyes are riddled throughout the stage, and they look in random indeterminate spots or follow Theo. But here, Madeline will illuminate two large statues that are both looking up into a vast pitch black void, where you must go next. When I arrived at this moment during my first playthrough, I was beyond apprehensive. What are these things looking at? What could be so bad that the creepy statues would ignore me, the intruder, and look at something else? If they're scared, then I should be terrified. Not knowing what was there was unsettling, and knowing that they could see it, but I couldn't, was dreadful. Disembodied eyes that gaze at you, or something you can't see, or even the feeling that eyes are watching you are all vague situations. You aren't exactly sure if you should be scared or not. There's not enough information for your mind to decide. When the flow of clear communication from another face is reduced to a simple gaze, the intent or reasoning behind that gaze is unclear. This is why masks tend to be a little troubling. Psychologist Claude Levi-Strauss suggested that the reason people tend to be afraid of clowns or people in masks is because the face paint or the mask itself cuts off the stream of communication from one person to another. You can't identify that person's emotions. 
If someone is smiling and winking at you, they probably like you, and if they're frowning and their brow is lowered, they may be angry with you. But in both cases, you at least know whether this person could be a threat or not. Isn't it odd how when you speak to someone wearing dark sunglasses, you sort of assume that they're staring directly at you, or that they're hiding something? Anything that covers or removes a portion of the face deprives us of the social information needed to understand someone's thoughts or attitudes. Masks conceal things, which is one reason why the Splicers in Fort Frolic, the Skull Kid, Pyramid Head, and the masked Matt Helms are nightmare fuel. Now, obviously, these are all threats as they try to kill you in-game, but the masks put up a wall so that you can't fully understand your pursuer. And you always fear what you don't understand. So, ambiguity is a huge part of what makes eyes so freaky in video games, but the same rules apply in real life. The Fear Survey Schedule 2, developed by James Gear, is often used to gauge people's most common fears. Among snakes, sharks, and nuclear war, some of the most commonly found fears using this survey is public speaking, humiliation, and social pressure. Fear does not come exclusively in the form of physical threats, but also social ones. According to a 1999 study, around 15-20% to of the population suffers from some form of glossophobia, or fear of public speaking. Having eyes follow you or watch you as you play a level, even if those eyes aren't disembodied, can be scary for some folk. These ghastly eyes following you in Kirby's Canvas course might put you on edge, but this audience in foul play might do the same if you are someone who deals with any level of social anxiety. What if the audience doesn't like your performance? What if you're playing Smash Bros with a group of friends and take an unmitigated loss? Not only would your friends laugh, but the in-game audience would add insult to injury by cheering the dude who just beat you. The knowledge that you could be embarrassed or judged by everyone watching could affect your performance. It could also make you shut down and play poorly. These fears of failure and disapproval can spark social inhibition, performing poorly in the presence of others. Any game that makes it clear you are being observed, whether that be by in-game entities like the audience and Guitar Hero who boo you when you mess up, or by real-life people in multiplayer, can have a huge effect on your experience. It can stifle your ability to think clearly and play smoothly. But an audience may not always trip up the player. Some may even prefer to have spectators, and thrive off the added pressure. Maybe you get a rise out of everyone's reactions to your skill. You might even play better with people around than you do alone. If so, it's likely because of social facilitation, which is the other side of the coin. To explore this, Robert Zajonk and his colleagues performed a study with cockroaches, where a single cockroach would need to find an exit from a light in a maze. In the control condition, our little friend would simply go it alone, but in the experimental condition, the roach had an audience of other cockroaches. When our six-legged friend had spectators, on average he and the other subjects made it to the exit much faster. They performed better while being observed. And that's bizarre, but true. Social facilitation is not exclusive to humans. But what separates facilitation from inhibition? In both cases there is an audience, so why do some thrive in it while others fail? To understand this and tie this whole video together, I should make it clear that the presence of others increases our overall arousal. When we are alone and reading a book, it's just us in the book and maybe a coffee table. But if someone else is in the room with us, suddenly we'll have to be at least a little alert. People, after all, are much more unpredictable than coffee tables. So we're vigilant. Our arousal is upped. And it's what we do with that arousal that makes the difference in our performance. In a 1982 study on this, pool players that were skilled at their game typically played much better with an audience than without one. On the flip side, unskilled pool players did much worse when being watched. In both cases, the audience created a higher state of arousal in each player, and in both cases, the dominant response was elicited. Skilled players are skilled, and playing well for them is probably natural. In the same way, playing poorly is only natural for unskilled players. For all players, the presence of a peanut gallery or an audience only sped up the inevitable. So, what do we take away from all this? 
Well, from a development standpoint, an in-game audience can be a brilliant way to get a rise out of the player, subject to where in the game it's used. If you place one at the end, during the final boss, when the player is already very skilled at the game, like in Pokemon Coliseum, you might 1. facilitate the player's skill and make them better during the final showdown, and 2. get them excited to show off their hard work as they take down the last big baddie. Conversely, if you want the player to experience anxiety or social inhibition from the crowd, place it earlier in the game when the player isn't very good yet. This can add a psychological challenge to whatever other challenge your game has to offer. When you perform poorly in Paper Mario The Thousand Year Door, the spectators will punish you by throwing trash and other things at you during combat. I love the idea of an audience that will make fun of or ridicule the player for poor performance, and I love to see more games that adopt that mechanic. I think it adds a new layer to the challenge. Lastly, if you want your games to be creepy and unsettling, make situations and enemies ambiguous. Cover faces, disembody some eyes, be clever about what information you present the player, and what information you withhold. Sometimes, the player's own deep dark imagination and ability to fill in the blanks is greater nightmare fuel than you could ever create. Hey, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed our little detour into the bizarre and skin crawling side of psychology, and I'd love to hear what you got out of it in the comments below. I thought it might be fun to revisit an old favorite of mine and do some psych research of my own to figure out how these constructs can make better games, and I'm happy with how it turned out. Thank you for the support, and I will see you next time.